Welcome, friends, to another edition of Tiffin Cast. I'm your host, Seishu, and I'm with photojournalist Louis Palou, who has um, just finished a wonderful project called Kandahar Journals, and he's got a Kickstarter campaign based on that project. So we talked we, we talk a little bit offline uh, about the project, but I wanted to bring him in to discuss it even more and to just sort of get a sense of like why he started the project and where he's going to go with it. Welcome, Louis. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, I know you are. Um, you, you've been you've been promoting Kandahar Journals off of Kickstarter for a couple of weeks now, and um, it's already funded. So we're not even going to talk about like the funding portion of it. But I'm just curious as to what motivated you to to even consider doing this project. Well, first I'd say, uh, you know, not to do sh more shameless self promotion, but. We are funded on the Kickstarter, but we set a very minimal, you know, humble goal compared to how much we really need because Kickstarter is all or nothing. So if anyone wants to be a part of the project and keep giving, we're still accepting donations for two more weeks. Um, but, you know, back to the project, uh, you know, fit, we finished several things, but, you know, a film is, if we calculate all the years we've worked on this, so three years in production with my, my co-director, Devin Gallagher, who's based out of Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we never really count the five years that I, I, I covered, the, you know, the war in Afghanistan from. So, you know, when we talk about motivation for covering war, I think that there are many different motivations for many different people. And I think that many of them are valid. And it's great to have variety. For me, what I really realized is that my parents uh, were born before the Second World War in northern Italy. And uh, I grew up at the kitchen table uh hearing stories you know it's all about storytelling mm -hmm. and i think uh every culture has their form of storytelling sort of you know help their their children embrace their culture embrace their past and uh, uh i heard a lot of stories about violence and trauma you know as a young boy uh, uh you know my parents growing up around this so th this became a very personal thing you know storytelling and and searching for who i am and what my roots are Wonderful. Uh, so you've got this great body of work uh, that you've created, uh, and it's a it's a film following you essentially through the process of photographing Afghanistan, Afghan specifically Kandahar, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, obviously, a lot went down in Kandahar, but there are other parts of uh, of Afghanistan that you could have easily uh -huh. have focused on. So, mm -hmm. did you? I haven't seen the film, obviously, but how, how, do, you, how do you reconcile the idea that you, you've just spent most of your time in one part of the country and not the other parts? Is that... Well, yeah. Well, over the five years, I, I visited many parts of, of actually of Afghanistan. Actually, the, the place I landed first was in Kabul. Uh, but essentially, I ended up down in Kandahar because it was by accident, actually. Uh, I, I'm, I'm Canadian. Uh, I was working for the National Newspaper of Canada, the Globe and Mail at the time. And in 2006, when the mission in Afghanistan brought in a NATO element to the U.S. part of the mission, uh, Canada took, took control of or, or command of Kandahar, of efforts in Kandahar. So I covered the war from there. But I, you know, I really had no idea what Kandahar was in the greater scheme of what Afghanistan's identity was. And uh, within about a year, I, I came to understand some pretty significant things about Kandahar. And I just felt like my... my job and my interest always lies in stories, facts, or great discoveries that have not been told, not been documented, written, or photographed. And you know, K Kandahar is, is this amazing backdrop to the story of our film. Uh, Alexander the Great founded Kandahar. Actually, Kandahar, you know, comes from the name Alexander, actually, Iskandar, Kandahar. Uh, the Taliban, when they took power in the 90s, moved their headquarters to, to Kandahar. It's the birthplace of the modern state of Afghanistan. Some of the holiest shrines and mosques in the country are in Kandahar. It literally became, for centuries, the place you had to control. You know, there was a Pashtun proverb, control Kandahar and you control Afghanistan, because it is the, the land bridge between the Middle East and Asia. And what, what that became is a great stage for a personal story. And... While we developed the film over several years, uh, my great colleagues, Murray Brewster, our writer, and uh, Devin Gallagher, my co-director, what we talked about is 
um, on that stage, what is the story? What is the unique perspective? And really the first-hand view of the war in a place no one really knew about within this place people thought they knew about was a unique thing that no one had spoken about yet. So Kandahar became this sort of unique stage, kind of like how Apocalypse Now, you know, is based on Hearts of Darkness. Right, 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 absolutely. By Joseph Conrad. Right. So we wanted, to, we wanted to do something like that with some deeper layers, not just be about a photographer who goes there and feels loss. It, it, it's sort of layers of history, layers of personal story, tragedy, loss, and we wanted to build a deeper theme. And what we really came to is that... Uh, you know, this film, War, is really a personal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, you really can't build a democracy with war, you know. So I, I think that these were sort of the core themes you started playing with. When you started to even consider the idea of making a movie, I mean, you had already been there uh, once or twice, I, mean, I imagine. And you probably said to yourself, oh, wow, this would be a fantastic story to, to, to do as a film. Mm -hmm. um, is that the process that you went through, or was it something like the other other folks who you you collaborated with came together at, uh, at a later stage, and you just decided yeah, yeah. to put it together? I've been shooting. You know, I'm a still photographer, and and uh, slowly, you know, video cameras became very affordable and very small. And so, in 2007, uh, I started shooting some video. And I realized the power of the medium and how accessible and cheap it was, how economical it was. And I began shooting like short little like diary, video diary pieces. And uh, I, I took a class in Arlington, Virginia at Arlington Independent Media. And my instructor was Devin Gallagher, who ended up wow. becoming my co-director. We became very good friends. He taught me. I took a class in editing, uh, uh, Final Cut Pro and... Uh, which is a editing software for those who don't know, and and TV production, and uh, we just became friends. And uh, he, he kept seeing what I was working on. I was working on these short pieces, and then once I'd finished my coverage in 2011, uh, Devin said, "Hey, if you ever want to make a film with that footage, uh, you know, we should talk." And uh, so it was very organic. He sort of planted the seed, and uh, we started talking, and we Lovely. were both very excited. We start we started playing with the footage at first, and then it just over the years, we got, we developed more and more story. Excellent. How many times have you been to Kandahar? Uh, off the top of my head, I think seven times. Wow. You know, ranging from three to four months to six months at a trip. Right. You know, with some breaks, of course, breaks in between. And I, I covered other stories, like, you know, I've been to Guantanamo Bay multiple times. So when I was in Kandahar and I was kind of taking a break, and, and, and taking a break, meaning not just because I was in another country, but covering frontline combat combat is pretty stressful. So uh, the the breaks were were not just physical; uh, they were psychological as well. So I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, this is a question that um, I hope you don't mind my asking you, but uh, mm -hmm. you, you've chosen to to showcase war in a very personal way. Mm -hmm. um, would you ever go back? to a situation where you'd have to do it all over again, perhaps in another country? Um, you know, it's funny you ask that because uh, I, right after I finished that, I, I, I resisted going back. I did not want to go back. I kind of reached my limit. You know, in 2010, I did some like 150 medevac missions. That's like a helicopter, a military helicopter ambulance. You can only imagine what you get seat back there. And, uh, in 2011, I was uh, offered the opportunity by a think tank uh, to, in based out of Washington D.C., to do some work on the U.S.-Mexico border, all relating to uh, the Mexican drug war. And I covered that, and, and it was a very different kind of conflict to cover. You know, a lot of people don't don't see that as an actual war, but it very much is a conflict. And I think that the Mexican drug war has changed the the nature of the meaning and definition of what war and conflict is, because. Uh, the ideas of two big armies arriving on a battlefield, you know, mm. decades ago or centuries ago, th this is kind of over now, you know. So uh, would I go back? Uh, yeah, there's a possibility. I've, I've had lots of inquiries and offers to do things like Syria, Libya, you know, all the Arab Springs. And I'll be honest, it's not that I didn't want to go to them. It's just I've been busy editing. Uh, you know, I, I have, I'm also editing a book of my work from Kandahar. Um, I'm, I've... I've the Mexico work 
became very, very popular. I, I put together a, a concept newspaper that challenges how we see and interpret things. Uh, it's called Mita Mexico. And uh, I've had a lot of exhibitions. And now we're editing the film, and I'll tell you that, you know, still photography is like a first date compared to the film. And film is like getting married and having triplets. <laughs> you know, it really, I, I, hope, I hope the metaphor is, is something that everybody can laugh at like you did. Because it's true. I mean, if, if you work on a feature-length film, it can really, really, really exhaust you. And, you know, uh, it's remarkable if you stick to something. You know, I've been known for my long-term projects. You know, some people call me a war photographer, and I guess I have been, or a combat photographer. I've definitely been that for a few years. Sure. But really, as a social documentary photographer or as a photojournalist, mm -hmm. uh, all my projects have been long term. My first project was on hard rock miners, underground miners, northern Canada and Quebec. That was 12 years plus three years of editing. Uh, and then I did projects on, on asbestos, Guantanamo Bay. There are many other projects I've worked on. So um, you can see them all on my website. And, uh, you know, a film is like a long term project, but I love the challenge because there are a lot of things I don't know, like, you know, editing a film. Working, you can't work alone on a film really like this. You have to have a crew, and we have an amazing crew. Like Devin Gallagher, my co-director, is a phenomenal guy. He's 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 worked so well in a team. He's very creative. He's great at challenging me in a constructive way. Uh, Murray Brewster, our writer, is just, I mean, one of the most phenomenal journalists I've ever had the pleasure and 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 uh, honor to work with. Uh, our, our Mark Mark Robichaud, our editor, who is awesome. Uh, then we have our, our our conductors, our composers, and then Don Langford, our associate producer, who's been a great advisor on the project. And then Jen Bachewell and Nick Dupensier, who are well-known Canadian documentary filmmakers, who became our mentors. And sort of, you know, over three years, it's it's remarkable, sort of the ups and downs in a film. Indeed, indeed. Um, from what I'm what I'm hearing from you, I mean, clearly you've you've been in the in the business of making uh, or telling stories with more than just still photography you've you're mm -hmm. you've you've sort of you've embraced uh the the multimedia world that that mm -hmm. we, we all talked about many years ago um as as being sort of the place to be um what would you say to emerging photographers or photo journalists right now would you say that having these skills is important uh, would you say focus solely on one thing and then collaborate with mm -hmm. other people what would your what would your take be after your experiences I, I think I think what everybody needs to do is they need to have a, a, a sense of balance there's really two things there's the reality of things you have to do to survive and make a living and there are things that you have to do to make you happy you know and, and there's gonna be a balance of those I mean there are assignments I do and I love being a professional photojournalist someone calls me and I go photograph something I, I file it and then I'm, I'm done uh, there are commissions I do, and, and these are not things that I would personally initiate, but I'm still a professional and I love my craft. Then there are things that are personally driven, kind of like this film. But, you know, even, even some of these personally driven projects, there are times where I just throw my hands in the air and think, why am I working on this? This is driving me crazy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I always try and see the end goal, and, and I don't try and pay too much attention to the bumps in the road. But I, what I think I'd really talk about embracing is not the literal things, but the conceptual things. You know, when we talk about multimedia, I was shooting Super 8 film making a, my first short documentary in 1991. And I recorded his audio with a tape recorder with a cassette tape, you know, not, not some fancy tape. And then it was silent Super 8. You know, sh getting a video camera back then to shoot a documentary, I mean, was, yeah. you know, it was inaccessible. Right. So, you know, multimedia, I went to art school. Multimedia was gluing pieces of paper and photographs on drawings and, and doing things back to the Bajo school of art, you know, where it's a concept. So... It really is about uh, accepting new concepts. It's kind of like online. Like I meet friends who are like, "Wow, your your Kickstarter campaign was remarkably, you know, successful." And they said, H "How can I? What can, could you share something with me?" And uh, I said, "Well, look, Facebook. It's not just about Facebook. It's about online platforms. Understanding what they can do for you." Well, I don't like Facebook. And I said, "Well, without social media, your Kickstarter campaign is going nowhere." And it's not about Facebook or Twitter or anything like that. It's about concepts. Mm -hmm. It's about embracing concepts. It's about adapting to change. It's about uh, enjoying what these things can do for you to share your work. I think that Instagram is, is you know, as a platform, w without advertising the brand name, but what Instagram is, it's sharing pictures. That's like the new magazine stand. 
and I can reach way more people now. The Instagram campaign for our Kickstarter worked remarkably. I don't think it'll work for everybody. Mm-hmm. I don't think it, see everybody's always looking for a silver bullet in our business. Yeah, yeah. There is no silver <laughs> bullet. Everybody wants to get a silver bullet and then show up to work every day and then use it for the news. Now the great thing is that it's changing every day. So you do that silver bullet and then that doesn't work anymore. Right. And then you do this silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. You got to have uh, you know 10 to 15 sort of unique collaborations. Uh, I'm always Everybody always says, oh, my client. I, I don't think of anyone as a client. I think of them as someone I collaborate with, whether it's you know the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, yep. Time Magazine, or whoever it is, a gallery, a museum, uh, you, people on Instagram. Everybody's my collaborator. I'm an artist, and I'm just sort of, these are the things I'm seeing and thinking about, and I'm sharing it with everybody, and we're all sharing it with each other. You know, And these concepts go back to uh, the days when we were in tribes, around a fire and we sit around and tell each other stuff. It's the same concept. So it really is about embracing concepts, not about getting stuck in uh, hard and fast sort of, okay, this is it. Everybody start doing this one thing. And I think that the internet now and the ability for individuals to make change is what is really driving this. I was going to ask you that exact question and you've answered it. <laughs> Louis, thank you so much. Um, no, no problem. I want to finish this, this this brief interview, I guess you'd call it, uh, by asking you uh-huh. how are you planning on distributing the film when it's done? What is what is your goal end goal for the film? Is it gonna be uh-huh. shown shown you know on big screens all over the country, yep. or is it going to be uh, sort of an art houses, or is it going to be more academic in, in scope? What is it? What is your I think we're going to be covering everything, actually, and this is a great question. I think that uh, I think I saw something in the news the other day that a third of all internet traffic is on Netflix. And again, you know, here we are quoting a brand name, but just let's just say online streaming movies. I think that it will be seen there for sure. Mm-hmm. I still believe in the uh, power of a focused room where you you consciously go to engage this piece of art, film, paintings, you know. Uh, there is a great new Van Gogh that the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. acquired, and I was there recently, uh, and I went to go see it. You can't beat going to see a, a real Van Gogh painting. See the strokes of the hand of a master artist, mm-hmm. you know? Right. And, and I think that that, that go, you know, movie theaters have been around for so long, and they keep being so popular for a very particular reason. It's not about the popcorn and the Cokes, although I like those and I always <laughs> overpay for them. Uh, it's going to start out on the festival circuit, you know, and documentaries don't do very well or rarely do well or, or are accepted into some mainstream theater distribution model. But we feel that there are people we do want to collaborate with broadcasters. We think that there are broadcasters who are kind of like curators at a museum or gallery or photo editors at a magazine. You know, there are broadcasters who are interested, there are distributors who are interested. And I think that, uh, you know, we're gonna. We see our film doing all these things, but something we do is we have a lot of content, and what we're probably gonna do is uh, edit short little mini shorts, like I've done in the past with my leftover content as educational pieces that will you know complement the film. Absolutely, absolutely. Louis, it's all about education. <clears throat> it is. It is no doubt, no doubt. I'm, and I'm so glad you're doing it because I think um, I was one of the <clears throat> first ones to. Look at what's what was happening, and uh, you know when when the U.S. decided to go into Afghanistan to say this is a stupid war, it's not going to work. Uh, but you know that was just my political bias at that point in time, uh, and I think it was based on the idea that we don't know anything about what uh, or who they are, you know. Yeah. And I think what you're doing is in a way educating us and telling us, look, these are these this is the ground level reality of who. Uh-huh. We're going to be working with you know, in the future, whether it's in peace or in war. We have to work with these people, and uh, and and so, thank you for for doing what you what you've done. No thanks. You know, you know. One final comment. It's about reading history. Now, you you could go read some history books, and it could change the game in your life and everybody else's. Study history. Your library's right near you. Mm-hmm. You can go online. It's very easy to read history. Indeed, Louis. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me, man. Take care. Bye. See ya.